This man changed the world. He took Iran and made it an inspiration for a new, uncompromising strand of Islam. Our bosses couldn't cope with the idea of an 80-year-old Ayatollah, which they didn't even know what an Ayatollah was, who lived on garlic and onions and yogurt, directing a revolution that was about to topple America's most important ally. His Iran broke all the rules of diplomacy. It unleashed forces the West still cannot handle. It has undermined the West's hold on the Middle East. Iran is deliberately causing maximum problems. Iran is a threat to world peace. I will do everything in my power to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Everything in my power. America and English are not going to be able to do it. Adam Koshis, that's the one who had this series tells the inside story of how, for 30 years, Iran has baffled and defeated Western leaders. Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini spent 14 years banished from his native Iran. From neighboring Iraq, he waged a holy war against the Shah of Iran. In the autumn of 1978, Iraq's leader, Saddam Hussein, presented the Shah with a startling choice. در این پیامی بود که اگر که بخواید این رو از اینجا به خارج میفرسیم و همینطور اگر که علاقمند باشید حتی باید الیمیت بشیم. The Shah was cautious. In those days we thought that if somebody get rid of Khomeini he will become uh, like a martyr and he become even greater. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi had ruled Iran for almost 40 years. He lived in a world apart from his people. He was kept in power by a vicious security service and the fifth largest army on earth, equipped with American weaponry. He ignored calls for democracy. He let the nation's vast oil wealth go only to the few. He promoted Western culture, enraging millions of Muslims. Many groups resented the Shah. They came together under Khomeini's banner. دین امام خواست های خودشون برآورده میکردن اونها هم که نه دیگاه دیگاه آزادی خواهانه داشتن ولو لایک گروه های سیاسی زیادی بودن باز هم در امام به عنوان چهره مبارز یک رهبر مبارز نیرومند که همه مردم تونست دور خودش بسیج کرده شخصیتی میدیدن که میتونن در حمایت از او قام بردارن برای آزادی کشورشون The Shah's government banned public gatherings During one rally in Tehran, troops shot more than a hundred demonstrators dead. We were waiting for the Imam to come. And the Imam of the Imam was announced that the Imam said that no one will not be able to do it. From that time, until the day of the day, the people were in the day of the day. From Iraq, Imam Khomeini was causing havoc in Iran. The Shah declined Saddam's offer to kill him, but agreed to his being expelled. Khomeini sought refuge in Kuwait. Khomeini <laughs> 
ما با گذرنامه هایی که داریم بدون ویزا راحت می توانیم وارد بشیم هیچ مشکلی نخواهیم داشت دوم این که پاریس یک مرکزیت سیاسی جهانی داره که هیچ کشور دیگه هیچ شهر دیگری در اروپا نداره Khomeini chose never to visit Paris even though he set up home 18 miles away A supporter lent him a house in the village of Neuf le Chateau Word went out to his followers round the world من توی شیکاگو فیزیک می‌خوندم که دکتر یزدی به من زنگ زد من دو بعد از نیمه شب توی هواپیما بودم به طرف پاریس 8 دلارم توی جیبم پول بود Khomeini was now in easy reach of the world's media اصلا برای البته اونها میخوان حق خودشون را استیفا کنند و So there is no alternative to fighting. Khomeini's success in stoking the revolution embarrassed the French president, an ally of the Shah. L'ayatollah Khomeini, il est venu en France dans des conditions régulières. Et il s'est installé comme non pas un réfugié politique dont il n'avait pas le statut, mais comme un étranger en résidence en France. President Giscard sent the official responsible for high-profile foreign visitors to issue a warning to the Ayatollah. Je suis donc arrivé dans ce pavillon de banlieue, dans cette chambre vraiment dénudée. Ça m'avait, ça m'avait impressionné. J'ai fait le rapprochement avec la cellule de moine. Il n'y a pas de canapé, il n'y a rien pour s'asseoir. Lui est assis par terre en tailleur, euh, en turbané de noir, euh, naturellement une barbe blanche, des yeux très vifs, scrutateur. Je lui dis, voilà, ces derniers jours, vous avez prononcé des philippiques enflammés contre le chef de l'État avec lequel nous avons des relations diplomatiques normales. Et donc, euh, il n'est pas raisonnable que sur le territoire français, vous teniez des propos de caractère politique important. Or, je me disais que je n'ai pas de politique française dans le pays de la France. Je n'ai pas de noms à l'Iran. Si l'Iran a des noms à l'Iran, ils ne sont pas en train de faire des noms à la France. En fait, Khomeini's house était une véritable production line, copying et distributing ses pronouncements. In Iran, anyone carrying Khomeini's words risked arrest. In Iran, we went to the telephone line. We found him for a telephone in Sharistan. He was arrested. He was arrested. Then he was taxed. He was arrested. That means that the Iranian government was arrested on the day of Iran. The whole country ground to a halt when strikes begun by the left received Khomeini's blessing. The military commanders drew up proposals to end the chaos. من این طرح بودم و به عرض رسوندم و قبلا اشاره کردم که علازت انقلاب اول باید بکوبین بعد ببینید چرا انقلاب شده. اگر معتل بشین انقلاب موفق میشه. و ایشون را رفتن و بعد اومدن گفتن یعنی شما میگویید من خلاف قانون اساسی رفتار کنم. گفتم قربان مملکت داره از دست میره و دیگه امر بفرمایید این کار بشه باز دوباره راه رفتن و گفتن دیگه چی دارین گفتم ساکت موندن و ایشون گفتم به هر حال من دیگه از این مسائل خسته شدم America was caught off guard for 30 years, the Shah had stood shoulder to shoulder with American presidents against the spread of communism and anti-Western movements in the Middle East. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. Now, just 10 months later, President Carter's words rang hollow. The question is beginning to arise how long the present government here can last with all those daily fighting on the streets of the 
It was a question the American ambassador and his deputy needed to answer. We were invited to this party. We both went around quite separately talking to the various generals and admirals. When I asked General Rabi uh, how things were going, he said, no problem at all. So I went over to Admiral Habib Balahi, and I asked the same penetrating question, how are things going? We said that وضع ما درسته ارتش سر جاشه این حالت پیدا نشه که داره رژیم متزلزل میشه کم کم here we were the country was in turmoil and there was not one significant mention of political problems disorder or anything i could not sleep that night in the morning i hustled over to the embassy I went in, I said, um, Mr. Ambassador, this is not going to work. He smiled and he threw to me a, a pile of a yellow lined paper with, his dra with writing on it and top was thinking the unthinkable. The ambassador's report to Washington spelled it out. The Shah's regime was in peril. The president called an emergency meeting. Our presumption was that the United States policies would be better off uh, if the Shah did stay in power. We were concerned that if Shah falls, the whole thing could become extremely unstable, not just in Iran, but in the region. But over how to save the Shah, the president's advisers were divided. Uh, Secretary Vance and I both felt that the best chance the Shah had to maintain his position was to go the direction of reform, to have early elections, to take human rights steps that would endure, would gain the confidence of his people. You first reestablish order, thereby asserting your authority, and the shortly thereafter initiate reforms, having proven that you're in charge. Brzezinski felt we should make it very clear to the Shah that we would not object in any way if he decided to really crack down very hard and use what Brzezinski came to call the, the iron fist. The message to the Shah was not clear. It urged him simultaneously to get tough with the protesters and to offer them concessions. The Shah summoned the ambassador. Ambassador Sullivan had to say, I have no instructions on this, Your Majesty, which left the, 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 the Shah very confused. The King of Kings went on TV and embraced the revolutionaries. انقلاب ملت ایران نمیتواند مورد تایید من به عنوان پادشاه ایران و به عنوان یک فرد ایرانی نباشد تضمین میکنم که حکومت ایران در آینده بر اساس قانون اساسی عدالت اجتماعی و اراده ملی و به دور از استبداد و ظلم و فساد خواهد بود The Shah announced that he and his family would soon be taking an extended holiday the Americans decided they had to act. Our intention was to make sure that the Shah's support was firm and to make sure that Iran didn't come apart. I said to the president that we ought to explore the question of what will be the behavior and the attitude of the Iranian military. President Carter turned to a general who had served in Iran. My instructions were to uh, give United States assurances to the military of Iran that we would support them. His mission was to go out and see if the Iranian military had the stomach to attempt a coup and to suppress the revolution. The general had to get the military to defend the throne while the Shah was away. <laughs> You had to have plans. You know, the immediate thought of these generals and admirals was to do what you're talking about, that they take control. 
but when asked how, they were speechless. Regime ما در اون موقع چنین اجازه رو نمیداد. چون خب ترسیم بود که یه دفعه این فکر یه روزی در ارتش پیدا نشه که خود سرانه چنین اقدامی بکنه. In his haste, the American general had failed to pay the usual courtesy call on the Shah. من خیلی کمتر اوقات علازت رو اینقدر عصبانی دیدم. خیلی معذرت می‌خوام اگر من این کلمه رو بگم ولی خب علازت فرمودن که این مرتیکه آمده به ایران و تمام همه جا رفته با همه ملاقات کرده. رئیس قرباقی رو هم دیده. حالا قبل از اینکه بره آمده از من می‌خواد خدافزی بکنه. He cautioned me and only as a Shah could do, and you'd have to know him and see him looking at you through his glasses with his penetrating look, that I should not forget who the King of Kings was. I saw him only once when he accompanied the American ambassador to come and inquire about the date of my departure and even the hour of my departure. That's all I discussed with General Heiser. Before his holiday, the Shah appointed a new prime minister, a moderate and former opponent of his regime, Shapur Bakhtiar. I hope that we can settle all dispute and misunderstanding between the king and the nation. We hope. Soon after, the Shah and his wife left Iran. <laughs> I had to take a little tranquilizer. I usually never took tranquilizers, but I had to take one not to cry or to feel sad. در همون موقعی که خداویزی میکنن یک افسری یه سرهنگی بود خودشو پارت کرد اول به پای آلازات و گفت آلازات نمیذاریم شما برید. از تو من بر میگردم. On that uh, plane, I was looking back and thinking, is it the last time I am seeing my land? The Shah had fled a popular uprising once before, in 1953. Then America and Britain had engineered a coup which put him back on the throne. Now, Western leaders were at a summit in the Caribbean. This time, they agreed the Shah was a lost cause, and their only hope for a pro-Western Iran was his new prime minister. President Carter asked President Giscard to help persuade Khomeini to keep away from Iran. The President of the Republic said, I received a message from President Carter who asked me to transmit it to Khomeini. Je suis arrivé, j'ai retrouvé, le, retrouvé mon ayatollah. Je leur ai dit que c'est le souhait du président des États-Unis que naturellement il fallait laisser un peu de temps pour que Jean-Paul Bertua puisse faire front aux difficultés du, de l'époque et que par conséquent euh, il souhaitait que. لایتالله دیفر سنگتور آن ایران نماینده فرانسوی گفتش که آیت الله هم باید که از دولت بختیار پشتیبانی بکنه و اگر نه ارتش ممکنه کودتا بکنه این پیغام تهدید زمینی هم داشت بر اینکه ارتش دست به کودتا خواهد زد به همین دلیل آقای خمینی هم عصبانی شد ایما رپوندید پریزیدن کارت دو کمپان c'est que s'il veut que les relations se rétablissent normalement, il faut naturellement qu'il cesse d'appuyer des forces contraires aux vœux du peuple. Or, j'interprète les vœux du peuple. Khomeini called on his supporters in Iran to give the soldiers flowers. شاه در میاد که برادر ارتشی ما به تو گل می دهیم تو به ما گلوله. Many soldiers were conscripts and followers of Khomeini. They deserted in droves. The revolutionaries set up reception centers to receive them. 
از مردم کمک خواسته بودیم و لباس شخصی تهیه کرده بودیم لباسشون رو عوض میکردیم خب میدونید که توی دوران سربازی یکی از چیزایی که تکلیف سرباز هست اینه که همیشه موی سرش باید زده شده باشه نمره دو باید سرش رو اصلاح بکنه خب بعد این وقتی نمیدن یه عده ای با لباس شخصی اما سرشون نمره ده اونا رو میخواستن بگیرن که ما گفتیم همه جوونا برن سرشون نمره دو بزنن A section of the military was determined to stop Khomeini by any means. Tahsin bud ke dar avval ke jolosh gerefte beshe va nayad hatta pishnahad in bud ke ki to ta pishnahad am ke dashtim in bud ke asan havapaymay ya helikopter ke shun biyan estefade konan uz zade beshe ro hava. In France, Khomeini's advisers agonized over the right moment to return. یه شب بعد از نماز مغرب شا که امام آمدن تو اتاق که ما بودیم همه گفتن که من به ذهنم رسیده دیگه بودن ما اینجا وجهی نداره بریم به ایران بعدم گفتن خب هر شما مجبور نیستید با من بیاید این یه سفر سفر خیلی میتونه خطرناکی باشه ما هم فکر میکردیم که هر چقدر تعداد خبرنگار بیشتر باشه بیمه برای اون هواپ ما و اون هواپیما امتر خواهد بود چون این خطر بود که ممکن بود هواپیما رو سرنگون بکنه I will not forget the hospitality of the French government and the French people and their sense of liberty During the flight, a German TV reporter was allowed into Khomeini's private cabin. Sonne ging gerade auf. Es war die Zeit des Morgengebets. Jedenfalls, ich habe ihn nie wieder so aufgeräumt gesehen wie an diesem frühen Morgen. Das ist das einzige Mal, dass ich ihn entspannt gesehen habe, habe lächeln gesehen. Nach dem Gebet, das war ohne großen Vorwand, übergab Khomeini ein gelbes, also braunes Kuvert an äh, Tabatabai. Sadek Tabatabai, a favorite relative of Khomeini, was being entrusted with the draft constitution that embodied Khomeini's vision for an Islamic Republic of Iran. It was a dangerous document. متصدی دوربینش بود گفتم که من یه امانتی رو به شما میدم در حالی که ضبط میشد این سر اون sagte mir wenn wir bei der ankunft nämlich getötet werden oder verhaftet werden dann verstecken sie das gut بیشون نگفتم که این پوش این پاکت هاوی چی هست they needn't have worried As he came down the steps, Khomeini brought 2,500 years of monarchy in Iran to an end. The Khomeini was like the Oqyanus Atlas, which was in the Tufan, was a good job. The conditions were that there was no other work. The man given the honor of driving Khomeini had taken on more than he bargained for. We had no idea that the man came to the salon, we didn't have to control him. مردم ریختن ماشین های اسکورت و بین ما و ماشین های اسکورت خایل شدن و مرتب من حس میکردم که دارن روی این ماشین بالا پایین میپرن از همون لحظه رانندگی رانندگی عادی نبود توی ماشین این شب تاریک میشد امام هم اصرار داشتن که من در ماشین رو کنم ایشون هیت به در بر رفتن خود من مونده بودم چیکار کنم Khomeini's people parted the crowd so a helicopter could come and rescue him from his own followers همچی که امام رفت تو هلیکوپتر من دیگه نفهمیدم من دولت تعیین می کنم من به فشتبانی این ملت دولت تعیین می کنم من تو دهن این دولت می زنم The 
revolutionaries now attacked police stations and military bases. Each time they captured one, they seized more weapons. After 10 days, the beleaguered military chiefs met. همه این وضعیت خراب و تشریح کردن فر کسی چیکار کرده مثلا فرمانده نیرو هوایی گفت که از روز سقف ادارهش اومده بیرون با هلیکوپتر برای اینکه تمام جاهای دیگه همطور ریختن مردم They argued through the night. به تیمسار هاتم پیشنهاد شد که بردارن یه چیزی بنویسه که ارتش بیطرف بمونه شاید بیطرفی ارتش باعث بشه که دیگه این سر و صدا و اینا به صورت بدتری که باعث جنگ داخلی و تقسیم مملکت اینا بشه نشه دیگه کم کم همه تایید کردن بعدش هم همه امضا کرد Next morning one of Khomeini's lieutenants took a phone call و وقتی تلفن رو قطع کرد گفتش که ارتش اطلاعیه داده که در دعوای بین مردم و حکومت بیطرف خواهد بود و دستور داده شده که نیروها به پادگان ها برگردند این به معنی پیروزی انقلاب بود همه هورا کشیدیم شادی کردیم و تبریک گفتیم بغل کردیم همدیگر رو The Shah's prime minister fled the country Many of the Shah's inner circle were summarily executed The part that was difficult I must say, on the nerves, was getting up and look at the morning paper and to see people that you'd known for a long time just lying on a slab with bullet holes throughout their body. America feared its embassy could become a target. It reduced its staff from over 2,000 to under 100. Then the Shah asked if he could settle in America. I advised strongly against an early admission of the Shah. I'm warned that if we did, it was such a sensitive matter that there could be considerable violence, demonstrations, agitation against the United States. President Carter agreed. My <clears throat> presumption was that I would not let him come into the United States. I argued that he should be allowed because we treated him as an ally in good times, and I felt it was our responsibility to treat him as a former ally but a friend in bad times. The president said, well, let me ask you one question. If we do this, and as some fear, our f uh, employees in our embassy in Iran are taken hostage, then what will your advice be? And the, and the room fell dead, and he said, I thought so. Meanwhile, Khomeini was fulfilling his dream. Iranians voted by referendum to make Iran an Islamic Republic. The new government called for the Shah to be sent back to stand trial. Country after country refused him entry. So for months, he wandered the globe. Then he appealed again to President Carter. One afternoon, I got a message that the Shah was confirmed to have terminal cancer and asked me if he could come in to New York for uh, diagnosis and treatment. The Shah had kept his cancer secret for four years. His doctors had told his wife, but she too never mentioned it, even to her husband. I had a feeling that he didn't want anybody to know, and I wanted to respect his wish. That is why I, I never asked him. This time, Carter agreed to admit the Shah. America's man in Tehran informed Foreign Minister Yazdi. He had advised strongly uh, for months before that about the difficulty of any kind of gesture toward the Shah or his family. I was well aware of that. I will never forget the words he gave me. We will do our best. He did not say, we will 
guarantee your security, he said we will do our best. اطلاع دادم که همونطوری که تمام شواهد رو قرار حکایت میکنه شما با آتش بازی میکنید و این رو شما در جبهه پاندورا رو باز میکنید. Iran's foreign minister was on his way to Algiers for Independence Day. So was Carter's top advisor, Dr. Brzezinski. I urged Foreign Minister Yazdi to have a talk with Brzezinski. I knew what that might mean. It would elevate the dialogue up to a point where it mattered. After the celebrations, they met in Brzezinski's suite. I told him that, first of all, we had no designs um, to use the Shah against the new regime in Iran. As I remember, I pointed out to him that the Shah was an ill man. خواستیم که شما اجازه بدید که پزشکان ما برن پرونده شاه رو ببینن شاه رو عیادت بکنن بتوانن به ما مستقل از شما گزارش رو بیدن I didn't see the need for any procedure of this sort which would be in a sense uh, negatively reflecting on the veracity of the US government و هر قدم شما بگید که ما برای خاطر موازین بشر دوستان این کاری کردیم ملت ایران نمیپذیره قابل حضم نیست براش حتی اگر ما سعی بکنیم مردم نمی بزیدن A small group of students now took center stage What they did next would poison relations between Iran and the West to this day فقط این حس رو داشتم که این حرکت توی این حرکت یه رمزی وجود داره یه اتفاقی دیگه داره میفته the student leader arranged to meet four colleagues at Tehran University. فکر می‌کردم مثلاً اگه بتونیم یه کاری بکنیم و آمریکا رو به وادار کنیم که شاه رو اخراج کنه از آمریکا یه موفقیتی برای انقلاب هست. طرح در حقیقت اشغال سفارت آمریکا به مدت دو روز یا سه روز حد اکثر و گروگان گرفتن آمریکایی‌ها توی جلسه من مطرح کردم و دو نفر از دوستان من مخالفت کردند. One who opposed was Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, Iran's future president. آقای احمدی نژاد گفت که این کار باعث تقویت شوروی میشه و باعث قدرت گرفتن سفارت شوروی میشه و ما اساسا توی دانشگاه ها و توی جامعهمون مشکل اصلیمون گروه های چپ و مارکسیست هستن. Clerics and communists had been allies of convenience in the revolution. Ahmadinejad feared the communists gaining ground. The three who wanted to seize the American embassy went ahead without him. They approached a cleric close to Khomeini. رهبر انقلاب اگه در جریان باشه شاید کار خوبی نباشه. 72 hours later students gathered outside the embassy. دانشجویان راهپیمایی می‌کردن. ما توی اون پوشش حرکت کردیم از دو تا چهار راه قبل از سفارت آمریکا. باید دستور عملیات رو من صادر می‌کردم به فرمانده عملیات. At first this demonstration seemed to me to be an interruption. That it was going to really mess us up on getting our timetable down. You know, it's amazing how you don't worry about the right things at the wrong time. And then when it, it happened very quickly, these hordes started to scale the walls. The acting ambassador was told just after leaving a meeting in the foreign ministry. I had to turn around rather quickly and go back to the foreign ministry, find help from where it mattered, and that was the foreign minister himself. من به اون آقای لینگن گفتم که خب من قبلا به شما در مذاکرات حضوری گفته بودم که اگر شما این کار بکنید باید منتظر چه چیزی باشه. I said, I know you warned me against this, but we've got, I need help. Only Khomeini could sort this out. But he was in the holy city of Qom, and he was taking his daily nap. Uh, I 
که از دانشگاه افسری از پلتفرم دانشگاه افسری ما استفاده می کردیم می رفتیم. By now, hundreds of students had entered the embassy compound. Vastly outnumbered, the U.S. Marines held their fire. They asked me, what should we do? And I said, given what you've told me, the degree of chaos surrounds you, the control that has now slipped away from your hands over there in the compound, you should surrender. And I gave that order. Good evening. The American embassy in Tehran is in the hands of Muslim students tonight. I have received assurances that they will be kept safe and, uh, and well. The administration's problem is no one knows whom to blame for the takeover of the embassy. Foreign Minister Yazdi said the Iranian government would do its best to resolve the matter. The foreign minister reached Qom and went straight to Khomeini. من به آقای خمینی نگفتم کیا اونجا هستن گفتم آقا رفتن این کارا رو کردن آقای خمینی به من گفتن که هر کس از بوری بریزشون بیرون He set off back to Tehran to carry out Khomeini's instruction to end the siege At the same time the students in the embassy set out to get the imam's blessing to continue it من زنگ زدم به آقای موسوی خمینی ها و گفتم که ما توی سفارت هستیم منتظرتون هستیم خودتون رو سریع برسونید نقش واسطه خوبی رو من میتونستم بر عهده بگیرم از جمله ارتباط بین دانشجویان و شخص حضرت امام The cleric called Khomeini's home and spoke to his friend Khomeini's son Ahmad Ahmad آقا پیام آقای موسوی خوینی ها رو به امام رسوندن و گفتن این دانشجویانی که این کار رو کردند معتقد و مسلمون هستند طرفدار انقلاب هستند Khomeini now used the students takeover to advance his vision for Iran نظر امام این بود که از قول من به دانشجویان بگید که جای خوبی رو گرفتند اصلا نگران نباشند اونجا رو محکم بگیرند شما میبینید که الان مرکز فساد امریکا را جوان ها رفتن گرفتن و امریکایی هم که در اونجا بوده گرفتن و اون لانه فساد را به دست آوردن و امریکا هم هیچ غلطی نمیتونه بود The students paraded their captives. I was taken outside. You know, the hordes were already out there screaming uh, death to the hostages. We were like animals in a zoo. Khomeini had breached the basic rule that enables diplomats to work in a crisis. In doing so, he had reversed the decision he gave Foreign Minister Yazdi, who had been at his side since his exile in Iraq. The cabinet now met in emergency session. آقای دکتر یزدی خاص عنوان میکنه که به لحاظ خارجی و از اینجوری نیرو شرایط اینجوری باید سعی کنیم که دیپلماسی خارجی اون رو چکار چکار بکنیم که آقای بازرگان با تندی بهش گفت تو مگه تو چکاری تو فکر میگی تو وزیر خارجه هستی وزارت خارجه توسط دو اداره نمیشه که بسیار برافروخته بودن و تاکید کردن که استعفا میدم که اون که در ایشون در خود دولت مطرح کرد که استعفا خواهند داد و نه تنها ایشون همه وزرا قبول کردن که یک دست جمعی استعفا بدن Khomeini's support of the students had enabled him to sweep the moderates out of government. A month later, he assumed the new post of supreme leader, giving him, in effect, total control. And the American diplomats remained in captivity. We sent word to the Ayatollah that if he uh, injured a hostage, that we would stop all commerce between Iran and the outside world by blockading their seaports and so forth. We didn't go into detail. And if he killed any hostages, that I would respond with military action. Is Iran now, in effect, at war with the United States? What do you mean by war? If you mean our armies against the United States armies, no, there is no such war. If you mean it is a battle of nerves, it is Carter's doing. 
But if the president says he refuses to return the Shah, and if the Imam says he will not free the hostages, then what, what can be the answer? He will not he, discuss He's it. not even going to listen to it. Khomeini rebuffed all America's efforts to get the hostages released. Three months after the embassy takeover, America imposed sanctions on Iran, freezing its U.S. assets and banning its oil imports. They had two or three different interrogations teams that worked me over. I was beaten, I was hung by my wrists, marched into trees, and yeah, of course with a blindfold on. They'd tie me up like a pretzel and come in about every 15 minutes, give me a couple of good swift kicks, pull me to my feet, and ask me a bunch of stupid questions. Good evening. For the first time since the Iran crisis began 40 days ago, President Carter has indicated a glimmer of hope in the conference. The hopes were false, and news channels gave a daily reminder of the embassy siege. The Shah finished his medical treatment and left America, but Khomeini still refused to release the hostages. It was seen around the world as a, an America no longer capable of dealing with her real problems. It humbled the administration in dealing with problems at home. It had a profound, prevailing, devastating, uh, paralyzing impact upon our government. I don't know how much longer we can sit here and uh, see them kept captive while the uh, situation around them uh, does uh, deteriorate. He saw our honor at stake. He knew that we had to act, and he said so. We began to figure out how we could extract the hostages from, from the Iranians. Their rescue plan would test America's armed forces to the limit. It required 14 aircraft to cross hundreds of miles of Iran. After refueling in the desert, eight helicopters would fly commandos to Tehran, where they would storm the embassy. A second group would seize an airbase outside the city. From here, the hostages would be flown home. The plan was known only to the president and a few of his top advisers. The Secretary of State, Cy Vance, was skeptical. One day, I remember, he said, Fritz, the rescue mission won't work. And I said, Cy, how can you say that? I, he said, I say it because I was on the Armed Services Committee staff for years. I was over in the Defense Department for years. I've been around them a lot. This will not work. When the Secretary of State was out of town, Carter summoned his top advisors. We decided to have a, a national security meeting. Vance was, was in Miami. Christopher, Warren Christopher was his representative. The president turned to me and asked me to review the diplomatic options. Of course, the meeting had taken me totally by surprise. The subject was so secret that Secretary Vance had never been able to share with me the possibility of a rescue. And so I just dug into the back of my head and tried to review what the diplomatic options were at the present time. All the principals, including myself, recommended that we proceed, that the diplomatic and other options were not working. And we voted unanimously to proceed with the rescue mission. To get the commandos in and all 52 hostages out required six helicopters. For safety, they sent eight. The decision was made earlier that if we didn't have enough helicopters to bring all our hostages out, that we wouldn't bring any because the ones remaining would undoubtedly be assassinated. From an aircraft carrier in the Arabian Sea, the helicopters flew more than 500 miles into Iran. Keeping low to avoid radar, they flew into a sandstorm. 
two developed faults. When the others reached the desert rendezvous to refuel, a third was found to be damaged. That left only five. At that point, we decided to withdraw. And we left all our equipment there and, and brought our people home. As they took off to leave, a helicopter collided with the refueling aircraft. The president was immediately informed. I was with the president when we got the call. And the president said, uh, have there been lives lost? And I saw his face turn white. And he said, I feared that. Five airmen and three commandos died in the crash. A human tragedy and, in election year, a political disaster. Congress still knew nothing about the mission. It was the vice president's job to inform its leaders before they heard the morning news. You can imagine those very painful conversations. Awakened from a dead sleep, uh, being told this, and they say, what, what? What are we doing? Where? When? How did we get into this? What do you mean, lives lost? I went on television the next morning, beginning at 6 o'clock, I believe, to tell the American people what happened, and it was all my fault. It was my decision to attempt the rescue operation. It was my decision to cancel it when problems developed in the placement of our rescue team for a future rescue operation. The responsibility is fully my own. Keen helicopter I آقای کارتر را ساقط کرد ما ساقط کردیم خدا هم ساقط کرد Although Khomeini crowed the Islamic Republic's own armed forces were in disarray Carter's sanctions stopped them obtaining spare parts The Shah's generals had fled or been executed Saddam Hussein saw an opportunity خدمت ایشون عرض کردم همیشه صدام داره زمزمه جای میکنه و او قرارداد الجزایر رو میان پاره کرده بوده اینا بنابراین هر چه زودتر جلوی ایمانا گرفته بشه The Islamic Republic was surrounded by hostile states to protect itself it needed sanctions lifted Khomeini was persuaded to open talks with America His negotiator met President Carter's on neutral ground in West Germany. ما قدم می‌زدیم در باغ کاخ مهمانان مهمان مهمان سرای وزارت خارجه بون که این خبر دادن که دوستان اومدن. وقتی من اومدم آقای کریستوفر از رو اومد من در قیافش تعجب رو می‌دیدم. I was really quite surprised he was a very good-looking dapper man in a sport coat and flannel slacks and so he looked very americanized. بعد از صحبت های اولیه و معارفه اولیه که به نمون صورت گرفت شرط رو من عنوان کردم یکی این که بازگردوندن دارایی های مسدود شده ای ایران و اموالی که یعنی تنخواهی که بر اساسش دولت وزا پنتاگون تجهیزات نظامی به ایران فروخته بود With respect to the funds that we had frozen in the United States I told him we had about 5.5 billion dollars frozen and we prepared to assemble those assets and return them to Iran. دو موردش رو خیلی تونستیم هم روز به نتیجه برسیم. On day two, they ran into their only sticking point, the Shah's personal fortune deposited in American banks. استدلال من به آقای کریستوفر این بود که اولا این رقم این رقم درآمد معقول یک فردی نیست، ملو زمام دار که پولی جای پسنداز کرده باشه این رقم نزدیک به 20 میلیارد اموال منقول و غیر منقول اینها خب تصاحبش غیر قانونی و غیر شرعی است I said look we have a real problem there under our constitution we simply can't give back assets that are claimed by others آقای کریستوفر گفت من اینا رو به واشنگتن منتقل میکنم و در جلسه بعدی که خواهیم داشت مسئله رو پی میگیریم it was September 22nd, 1980. It looked as if Carter could get the hostages home in time to boost his chance of re-election in November. When I went to the airport, 
خلبان آمد که برج اجازه پرواز به ما نداد گفتن که فرودگاه مهرآباد بمباران شده توسط نیروهای عراقی The next day Iraq invaded Iran 70000 troops crossed the border launching a war which would last 8 years and leave a million dead Iran's leaders broke off the talks with America. They suspected Washington was behind the invasion. They were not totally wrong. We were warned that the invasion was imminent. A source told me that he'd just been in Iraq where he'd been meeting with Saddam Hussein and his senior Iraqi generals and that the Iraqis were going to invade Iran. Uh, this was of course big news and quite an intelligence coup for us. America did nothing to stop the invasion. In fact, though it had no diplomatic relations with Saddam's Iraq, it allowed help to reach him. We understood that what we were telling Saudi Arabia and Jordan about our perceptions of the state of the Iranian military would be passed to Iraq. How powerful did we think their armor forces were? Could they operate their tanks? Could they operate their surface-to-air missile networks? Uh, these were the types of information that we would provide to uh, our, our friends and which we expected they would pass on to Iraq. Six days into the war, with Iraq's forces in Iran and still advancing, the UN Security Council called for a ceasefire, but made no demand for Iraq to withdraw, giving Iranians a grievance that rankles to this day. زور ممکنه یک کشور متجاوزی رو محکوم نکنن و از اون نخواهند که برگرد به معزهات و بابت این تجاوزی که کردی غرامت بپرداز فقط بگن که آتش بس بدید آتش بس بدید یعنی تجاوز ما بپذیریم اون موقع من مسئول تدارکات سپا بودم و امکانات میخواستن اسلحه میخواستن مهمات میخواستن تجهیزات میخواستن جنگ عراق با ایران نبود وقتی من معمول بودم برای پشتیبانی از سپاه امکان تهیه بکنم همه دنیا به صدام میفروختن ایران بدلی نیدید ویپنز بود کود نات بای دم از لانگ از ایت هلد دی امریکن دیپلومتز کپتیو ایتس پارلمنت ووتید تو ریزیوم دی نگوسیشنز وید امریکا بود دی نیوز ریچد کارتر تو لیت تو سیف ایم فرم دیفیت این دی پریزیدنشل الیکشن ای پرامیش یو فور یرز اگو that I would never lie to you. So I can't stand here tonight and say it doesn't hurt. He now determined to get the hostages home in the two months left before Ronald Reagan took office. The negotiations moved to Algeria. The final sticking point was $9.5 billion of Iranian government assets in American banks, frozen by the US government when its embassy was seized. I said to the foreign minister, the most we can assemble is $7.9 billion. And I think it's in their interest to accept that because dealing with President Reagan might be much more difficult than dealing with us. It was the Americans' final offer. After two days and two nights of negotiation, I'd gone back to my room to shower, and I got a call from the foreign minister saying, I think we have an acceptance. So I went back and signed in the clothes I'd been wearing for three days. But Iran would not release the hostages until America delivered the money. And Carter was leaving office in 36 hours. There were immense technicalities that had to be dealt with, banks in like three different, four different countries, uh, all of these escrow accounts, and we'd just about come to the conclusion that, that nothing could possibly be done, that they were just going to have to deal with the next administration. I never went to bed at all. I stayed up and I, I was in charge of every detail of the agreement. That ought to be kept firm. The $7.9 billion of frozen Iranian assets, now held in banks around the world, still had to be retrieved. One of the key ones was the Bank of England, because they were holding about $2 billion of, of gold bullion that was owned by Iran. Tell them I would like to know from the president of chairman of the Bank of England why they have held up our hostages. We had to get Mrs. Thatcher to agree to let that two billion be in the pot. Okay, so the Bank of England has certified the depository. Right on, man, that's great, that's great. That was one obstacle overcome. There were more. 
Suddenly, the lines went dead. Nothing was happening. We found out that there was a U.S. Treasury official who didn't like the deal, whose signature was necessary to move the papers forward, who went home. So the President of the United States said, this person is fired. And so we got, we got past that. The hostages had been held for 15 months, often in solitary confinement. Two hours before Reagan's inauguration, they were assembled. We were all blindfolded. I can remember my irritation with one of the hostage takers who were pushing us on the bus, because uh, we were always being pushed around. The hostages tore off their blindfolds and saw they were on the road to the airport. In Washington, the vice president and president prepared to leave for Reagan's inauguration. As I left the Oval Office, there was Gary Sick uh, sitting by the president's chair in his own smaller chair on the phone waiting to see if there's any news about the hostages. I was listening with one ear to the reports coming out of Tehran about what where the hostages were and what was going on. The hostages reached Tehran airport. Prodded, poked at, screamed at by dozens of hostage takers, prison guards between the bus and the ramp up to the aircraft. We hadn't seen each other for 444 days. All of us uh, embracing each other, getting to know each other again. But the plane sat on the runway. Carter was despairing because he had hoped at least to get these hostages home uh, while he was president. We rode in a limousine to the uh, Capitol for the inauguration ceremony. I had uh, direct communication, obviously, with our intelligence around the world. I talked to him uh, while he was in the car. He said that the hostages were apparently at the airport, but we had no evidence that anything had happened. Repeat after me, I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President. Carter left for home. Still no news. Roughly five minutes after I was no longer president, the Secret Service agent <coughs> came down and whispered in my ear that the hostages were free. They had deliberately delayed its release until maybe 20 seconds after Reagan had been sworn in. It is not often that a foreign leader humiliates and helps secure the electoral defeat of an American president. Ayatollah Khomeini had laid down a pattern of intransigence that continues to this day and still bamboozles the West. On BBC Four now, an absorbing insight into life inside modern Tehran. Raggy Omar reveals the hopes and fears of the upcoming generation from a pop star to a renowned photojournalist and staff at a drug rehab centre. What I'm trying to do, I'm trying to make a sense out of the big... <laughs> uh, a big and I shouldn't the be The problem laughing. is, the more I dig in, yeah. the more dirt come, comes out. Right. And then I get overwhelmed. Yes. And because I'm not a journalist, yes. I yes. don't know how to sort out. Yes. In my own head. It's Why do you think journalists it. are any better at it? My name is Samira. Some people call me Sam. I was born in Iran, but New York is my home. 
25 years ago, back in Iran, I witnessed a revolution that had promised emancipation from Western domination. It also led to terrible bloodshed and death. My father's execution at the hands of the new regime forced me to confront then the first outburst of what would become known as Muslim extremist fundamentalism. My family and I emigrated to the United States, carrying our roots in our suitcases, searching for a home where we could find a purpose for our shattered lives and give meaning to the rubble and ashes we left behind. You know, what's fascinating to me when you look at, uh, when you look at America is that still uh, the promise is here, the possibility is here. And I think that the uh, new immigrant communities in the United States are just beginning to find their appropriate political voice. And you'll see some amazing political change as a result of that. It took many years. But finally, it was in New York that I felt I could unpack my suitcase to put down my roots, to love without fear and live without rage. Then came September 11, 2001. Now, the anti-American flames of wrath had reached America itself. What I had escaped from more than two decades ago seemed to have caught up with me. The first time I chose to escape, this time, I wanted to understand. What do you think is the difference between killing in the name of Islam uh, with killing in the name of democracy? I don't want to comment on that. Okay. That's just a contentious question. You're just trying to bait me. No, no. no I, I, I'm trying to understand. I just yeah, but your questions are very contentious. What was the source of this mad rage? What motivated